John, you are a great friend of both of ours. And first of all, thanks, mate, for jumping on at such an early hour to chat with us uh, about this whole idea of being for your community. Um, where we've got many churches in the UK and Ireland, here in Australia, and even in New Zealand as well, that have picked up on this for kind of branding and initiative. And so we're super excited to hear more about that from you because you've just taken on a new role there at Buckhead Church in this whole area. But before we dive into all of that, we'd love to know a little bit more about John Hambrick. You've written a couple of books, one gr a couple of great books, Move Towards the Mess, uh, which is an excellent, excellent resource on what does it mean to actually follow Jesus. It typically leads to places that are a little bit messy. And then uh, the other one, Black and White, which is a great, great way of overcoming the racial divide one friendship at a time with your good friend Tisha and I'm super excited about both of those books and would recommend them we'll pop those into the chat uh some links to those but John give us a little bit of background on your ministry so you you've actually ministered in the UK you've got family in Australia so you got some that's connections right. around the world that's right so yes yeah, so I uh, grew up uh in Southern California on the beach in a, a town called Ventura about an hour north of Los Angeles Started following Jesus when I was about 17. Okay. Um, he took me to Fuller Seminary, where I, uh, after I went to University of Pepperdine, uh, and it got an MDiv at Fuller, then went back to my hometown of Ventura, worked at a Presbyterian church there, worked for an organization called Young Life, which is just an amazing organization. Uh, got married, have a couple of kids who are now adults, but then in 1992, Patty and the kids and I hopped on a plane and moved to London. Wow. And um, I had two jobs there. I was working at the American Church in London, and then also I was one of the chaplains at King's College University of London, and okay. was there about five years. We always thought we'd go back to the States uh, and back to Ventura, actually. But God had other plans. We ended up in Atlanta, Georgia, where I worked for a while at a big Presbyterian church again. And then 17 years ago, uh, got on staff at uh, North Point Ministries at the Buckhead campus. So I've been here 17 years. And uh, in the meantime, went back to school to get another degree because I just love to study. Yeah, absolutely. And we love to hang out on a regular basis. In fact, I have the privilege of hanging out with John at least once a month and just talking all things ministry and leadership and we really spend quite a bit of time on an area that i'm i'm super passionate about so john thanks for indulging me in talking about my passion of of really this idea of working on your inner life because we're all as leaders we all know this that the health of our inner life will eventually be revealed in our external life and ministry and uh, so, John, thank you for the investment you've made in my life. I'm super grateful. But, Duncan, we, we've got to dive into this con conversation that we've been uh, talking about and promoting in this webinar around what does it look like to really connect and engage with your community? Duncan, you had a great question before we get into, like, what to do and how to do it. You had a great question. I'd love for you to throw that to John right now. Yeah, just before I ask the question, John, what's your job title? Because you've started this new job, like you say, at Buckhead. Have you got a title? Yeah, I do. It's called Director of Community Relations. Oh, brilliant. It's, I love that. it's all about ministry outside the walls of the church uh, in the city. Um, and hopefully we'll get to talk a bit about that. Yeah, uh, well, let's dive right in because, you know, uh, was it six months ago or so, Andy drops this new strategy for all your churches yep. that you are, you know, your whole strategy, you're going to endear yourself to the local community, build your reputation so they know that you're there and they know that you care. Yep. Uh, and then you're going to uh, in create inspiring experiences, you know, online and, and in person for all ages. And then you're going to equip the core, you know, your leaders, your volunteers, equip them to be more like Jesus. So it's a great strategy. But I, one pastor said to me, I think they've got it wrong. I think you need to start with inspiring experiences and, and, and equipping your core so that people are strong spiritually and then they can go out yep. and endear the community. So I, I just want to throw the question to you. Why did you start with endear and not finish with it? Why is that the number one step on the list? Why is it so important? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. Our, our contention would be that... Um, because we're all about, you know, we're trying to do exactly what Jesus asked us to do in Matthew 28, to make disciples. Um, that's, those are our marching orders, right? Um, 
but we would say to delay serving uh, till somebody had developed spiritually would actually um, cause a deficiency of development. So we think by getting people involved in ministry from the get-go, that is actually a part of the discipleship experience. That's actually a part of the way God shapes and forms us to be like Jesus. And to delay that would be to cause a bit of a dysfunction in terms of our spiritual development. I love that. That's so cool because, you know, it's a bit like it's a bit like learning to be a doctor or a nurse. You can sit in a classroom for as long as you want, but until you're actually on the wards in the hospital yeah. with patients elbow deep in blood, you don't fully understand the whole deal, do you? So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and exactly. So that's why. That's why we do it that way. That's why we say, no, you know, you don't need to be very far down the road at all. In fact, let's if, even if you're just getting started, let's let's go out into the city and serve the poor and um, see what Jesus is doing out there and try to participate. That will shape and form who we are in Jesus. It's true, isn't it? It's, it I mean, I don't know about you, Perko, but, but you know, it, when I hear the preacher say, I have to pray more, I think, okay, I need to pray more. And I, I close my eyes and I put my hands together and I, I think, what am I going to pray for? And, you know, and you, you end up just praying generally for stuff, you know, thank you for the sunshine and my family. And, but when you're elbow deep in the lives of those who are pretty messy and outside the walls of the church and you long to see their lives um, get unbroken and fixed and, and get them to meet with Jesus, you never have to wonder what you want to pray for. Suddenly your prayer life goes through the window. Absolutely. And I, rem I learned this when I was working for Young Life uh, a long time ago. You know, you're out there uh, hanging out with high school students who don't give a rip about you being there. Um, and you put your you put yourself you place yourself well outside your comfort zone, and that just has uh, a, a very rejuvenating effect on your prayer life. And all of a sudden, you're praying the prayers of somebody who's desperately dependent on Jesus to move. Otherwise, nothing's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Good. So I love that. If we if if we as leaders and we as pastors, if we looked at community service less as a kind of a program, but as the next step in the discipleship program or the discipleship life of a believer. Then I think that could revolutionize everything, really, couldn't it? Absolutely. And there's there's a strategic value to this as well that I might add. Um, and I think this is particularly true in Western Europe and the United States and Australia. Um, you know, 21st century communication technology has just exploded. Pretty much everybody in all of our respective countries have heard the name of Jesus at this point. I mean, I, it would be difficult to find anybody who would say, what? Everybody's heard the name of Jesus, but precious few people have experienced the love of Jesus. Yeah. And so, you know, I think some people say, well, we just got to we just got to preach the gospel more loudly or more cleverly or add better music or something. And I'm all about preaching the gospel, all about that. I'm just saying that in terms of where we are in the cultural history of our respective communities, they've already heard proclamation of the gospel they've got to see the love that the gospel assumes or otherwise uh, our continued efforts to preach will fall on deaf ears because you guys know this outside the walls of the church especially in the united states but i think this is true in a much larger area people don't believe don't believe that we love them we they think we're here to judge them mm. and um because of that, they have questions about whether God loves them. So right now, if we're serious about preaching gospel, we need to get out there and get our hands dirty to show people the love of Jesus because they've already heard the name of Jesus. Now yeah. we need to show them what it means to follow Jesus. Yeah. Can I, can I just get a little bit contentious here then? Please, um, please I, do. I was, I was on a call with you, John, um, last week, I think, and you said something that messed with my head. You, you use this phrase that I think you've had in your um, vocabulary for decades now. You talked about this mantra of being on their turf, um, operating under their terms, their turf, yeah. their turf. And that messed with me because so if you're taking Christians out onto their turf and we're supposed to play the game according to their terms, doesn't that get a little bit messy theologically? I mean, have you not found yourself in some places where you think, how am I supposed to operate as a Jesus follower now? I mean, for example, for example, a, a guy in my church came to me a little while ago and he said, every Christmas, everybody at work goes to a strip joint. They go to see all the blokes go out for us because he's all men that work there. They all go. Yep, and he yep. said, as a Christian, I've always said, no, I'm not going now. And now I've heard you, Duncan, preach about, you know, we need to be out there more than in here. 
I'm thinking, should I be going to this strip joint? I mean, it's just a bit messy, isn't it? How do I? So I just wondered how you, how you, how you help Christians who are thinking, but we are supposed to be separate from the world, not in, invested in all that dirty stuff that goes on out there. Yeah, th um, I think I think that's a misunderstanding of what Paul writes about. Um, I I would say, uh, if you're not in the middle of, of the mess, you're not doing it right. Um, and and I would just reference, look, look at the three years of Jesus' public ministry. You know, he was constantly uh, out there amongst people who religious people shunned and condemned. He was constantly in the midst of controversy. I mean, thousands of people were following him to wait to see what's, what's this guy going to do next. We love it when he gets in an argument with the Pharisees because it's just so interesting. So I would say um, that's where he's calling us out into the world. And, um, you know, and I get this, you know, it'd be, it would be so much more comfortable for me to sit inside the walls of Buckhead Church. I mean, we got a nice building, right? You guys have been there. Mm, and just say, hey, if you're interested building. in this, yeah, right. <clears throat> It'd be so much easier, so much more comfortable just to sit in there and say, hey, if you're interested in Jesus, come see us. You know, we'll tell you all about it. Well, that's not working anymore. You know, maybe there was a time when that worked, but at least in where I live, uh, people are going, yeah, you Christians, you're all about judging me. And so, no, I'm not coming to your church. I don't care uh, what kind of music you put up there, you know, I mean, good for you that you have good music and great if you have a great speaker, but I'm not interested because I, you know, I got your Christian's number, you know, you guys just want to get us in there and condemn us and guilt us so that we somehow uh, feel badly about ourselves and that's not working anymore. So we need to go where they are. I mean, it's, it's, it's all, you know, this is all anchored by the theology of the incarnation. Mm. It says in Romans 5, you guys know this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, God didn't wait up there for us to come to him. He said, I'm going in after them. So in the person of Jesus, he goes into a specific time, a specific place, a specific culture, and just gets involved. And that's why Jesus spent very little time in religious sites. He was always out there amongst the people. And I think that's what he's calling us to do today. And yes, it is messy. In fact, I would say again, if it's not messy, we're not doing it right. John, I want to I want to back up just a second and talk a little bit about or ask you a little bit about the discipleship aspect that we actually call people into. We we invite people. It sounds like to me you're inviting people to get involved in some things before they're quote unquote ready or trained or prepared or whatever. Like you you talked about your own example of being out there on high school campuses with young life not feeling prepared or maybe even relevant or ready to go. And it makes people rely on, on Christ. Have you seen it or experienced? I should say, I guess the question I'm asking is how often have you seen that become a train wreck for someone versus that actually being an experience that drove their discipleship deeper than had they waited, so to speak, until they were prepared. Yeah, you know, um, so I've been doing this a long time. Um, so it would take me a bit to, to scrutinize the past 40 years to see if I could find any train wrecks. Yeah. But off the top of my head, I don't recall anybody who said, after they had been out in the city loving people in Jesus' name, I don't recall anybody who said, you know, if that's what this is about, I'm out. You know, that, or, but I could, I could tell you hundreds of stories of people, kids and adults who went out into the city to love people in Jesus name, who were profoundly shaped and formed and changed by that experience. So I just think it's a, it's a, not only is it the best way, but it's the, it's the way we've been uh, commanded to go where people are. That's what Jesus did. That's what he's calling us to do. I could tell you, we did a, um, we did a, way back in the day, we did this thing called City to Sea, um, where we took a group of high school kids and uh, plunked them down. It was with a supervised, or it was an organization that supervised all this. So they, they made sure we were as safe as possible in South Central Los Angeles. But we spent a week in South Central Los Angeles in soup kitchens, staffing a daycare center, making sandwiches, um, 
right in the middle of it. You know, uh, at night we were in these apartments and we heard gunshots. Um, so, it, you know, looking back, I'm wondering, did we maybe take too much of a risk, but God took care of us. And out of that, and then the sea part was, then we hopped on some sailboats and sailed out to uh, uh, Anacapa Island off the coast of Southern California. And we took two or three days to prayerfully reflect on the several days we had just spent in the inner city of Los Angeles. And what I can tell you is that a handful of lives were changed forever by that. People moved into lifetime of ministry. Um, their worldview has changed. Their paradigm shifted because we spent three days in South Central Los Angeles. So I've seen, and that's just one example I've seen time and again, where people will place themselves uh, outside of their comfort zone in Jesus' name to love the people that Jesus brings to them. It has a profound impact on their formation as a disciple. Yeah. So it, what you, it sounds like to me, John, what you're saying is this idea of endearing the community and being for Atlanta, Atlanta or for whatever community you're, you're serving in is as much about endearing the church to the community and changing the church's perception in the community from not being this judging group of people, but this loving group of people. It's as much about that as it is equipping the core in the discipleship process. It's a both and. It's, yes, and I think we tend to think in binary terms. What's well, either this, it's either discipleship or it's out there serving. I think you just nail it. It's both and. Yeah. It, it, it's uh, we're doing both at the same time. So, so, so here's, here's the rub then. Um, <laughs> I'm just trying to put my lead past the hat on because most people listening to this conversation are influential people in the life of churches, they're leaders, they're lead pastors. Yep. Um, and, and you're piquing the interest of lead pastors because they're thinking, great, this is a great way of growing people up in Jesus. Fantastic. Um, and, and if I know anything about lead pastors, they're going to try and find the quickest route to making this happen. So, yep. the, so the, the idea is uh, what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll do a weekend. You know, we'll drop the drawbridge down from our church. We'll cancel Sunday morning and we'll all go out and litter pick in our community or we'll go paint some um, walls or fix some broken fences or cut the grass on the village green or whatever it might be. We'll go and do so. And then we'll run back in next weekend, back into our communities. And, you know, tick, we've done for Atlanta. We've done for our communities and people are discipled and people out there know that we care and that we love them. Um, job done. You know, so I, I just wondered how, how do you, is there a difference between a campaign and a whole culture change within the life of church? And how do you change a culture so that it doesn't just become campaign based? Yeah, that's such a good question. Okay. These, these uh, experiences I talked about the city to see, and there's countless other ones. Um, <clears throat> it's important to point out, given your question, Duncan, uh, that happened in the midst of a relationship um, where I had spent um, countless hours uh, studying scripture with these with these kids and these adults, praying together, walking along beside them, um, and then being with them when we were out in the city serving people in Jesus' name. So these experiences, like the city to see, the one I mentioned, think of that as a, as a, a snapshot, um, one incident uh, in the life of, of a relationship. So countless hours before that, with them in that, helping them to understand, you know, the reason we went out to that, that island to, to think about this and reflect on this is because there's a lot of questions. You've got you've to interpret the experience for people, you know, um, which is what people did for me. And so it, it's part of a relationship. It's, it's not very efficient. It's not very quick. But um, Jason, you said this the other day. Um, could you, could you rec recreate that quote for us? <laughs> Remember what we were talking about? We wanted we wanted to do. Uh, I'm going to butcher it, so you need to say it. No, you go you go ahead because it'll jog my memory. Please do. Um, you said something about we want to do we want to reach a a bunch of people now. And, oh, but, yeah. Say it. Yeah. See, I'm not remembering it correctly, but you're about. I just saw that flash of recognition on your face. You're about to deliver a a world class quote. It's not a world class quote, but I think. What I was saying, John, is that I, I sense that maybe we've got the funnel upside yeah, there we go. down. That's it. Yep. And, and we're maybe trying to bring the masses in on the top end of the funnel, 
hoping that maybe a few might come out fully discipled, whereas it seems like Jesus discipled a few or a dozen, and thousands of years later, we have millions of people who claim to be followers of Jesus. Absolutely. See, Duncan, you're interviewing the wrong guy here. You should be interviewing Perko. No. Um, and, and by the way, uh, the book that was given me by the man who discipled me way back in the day, his name is Daryl Johnson, by the way, worth looking that guy up. He gave me a book called The Master Plan of Evangelism by Robert Coleman. And that was the quintessential articulation of that idea that you just talked about, Jason. And it changed yeah. everything for me. And thank heavens, uh, he gave that to me when I was 18 or 19 years old, and it shaped everything. Master Plan of Evangelism by Robert Coleman. Yeah, I'll make you- Classic. Your, it's a classic. Your, buy the book. If you don't like it, I'll buy it off you. I, you know, <laughs> Jason and Duncan will figure out how to make that happen economically, but buy the book. If you don't like it, I'll buy it off you because it's that good. I'm that confident it will change everything for you. Yeah. So John, I, I want to press in a little bit on this changing it from a campaign to a culture. And I'm going to be a little bit controversial here, maybe, but North Point have historically been very good at a thing called be rich. Yep. And it happens around the fall it's incredible, like the autumn time period, kind of that October time frame. You were in, you were integral in, in helping to launch a thing called Intersect, which is all of the not-for-profit organizations in the community that benefit from the partnership with Be Rich. Yep. So my, my question is this. It seems like one could look at that and say, well, the timing of that right before Thanksgiving and Christmas helps us to maybe feel a little bit better about the opulence that we're about to experience throughout the, the next coming months of the holidays. How do you move that, John, from a once a year event to becoming a part of the daily culture of an organization? What does that look like? You guys ask good questions. You, have you thought about doing this full time? I'm just asking. <laughs> wait, um, wait, Duncan and I are thinking about maybe doing this more often. Okay, good. Let me know. I'll watch. Um, <laughs> I'm repeating myself here, I guess, a little bit, but it bears repeating. The, the catalyst that will move things from a campaign to a lifestyle, the catalyst is relationship. Okay. So if, if you don't know these people, if, if you're not walking along beside them, which is the way I define discipleship, you walk along beside people, you, you know, you, um, we say you do life together, however you want to frame it. But, but if that's not in place before the campaign, then it's nothing more than a campaign. And I don't want to, I don't want to um, denigrate the campaign. I mean, it, it frees up a lot of money and a lot of volunteer hours. It's a tremendous help to our, the nonprofits we, we uh, partner with. But in terms of discipleship, there needs to be a relational context that is pre-existent before Be Rich or Be Rich uh, really doesn't have much of a chance to be anything but a campaign. A campaign is good, but discipleship is better. And if you have that relationship in place where you're walking along beside people for, you know, months prior to the campaign, and then uh, during the course of the campaign, you say, hey, we're today, the people that I've been meeting with weekly to pray and read scripture and, and be together. Hey, today we're going out to Atlanta Mission to serve. That all of a sudden becomes a part of a discipleship process, but it's all about a pre-existent relationship. That is the catalyst that transforms Be Rich from a campaign, as good as that is, and it's something much more profound, something much more long-lasting, something that in the long run has a much greater impact for the kingdom. Yeah, because relationally, if you're connected with someone relationally, you don't, you don't shoot them an email once a year and say, hey, what's the project you need money for this year because we're about to do the Be Rich campaign? You're in a constant conversation because you're in yeah. constant relationship with that person. So all of the sudden, the needs of that organization or individual for that matter, now are relevant on a daily basis and you can be engaging Absolutely. in that. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Now here's, here's, I can imagine, I'm putting myself in the place of, of the pastors that are listening in. I would imagine some of them are saying, well, where am I going to find the time to do that? You know, I've got a, a worship service every week, you know, the building campaign, you know, the, the board of elders, all these things. 
and you got this is you guys already know this. I just want to remind you of something that you already know. The key here is not for pastors to do all this discipling. The key here is for pastors to disciple the people that will be discipling the larger the larger uh, community. Yeah. So pastors are trying to do all this. That's just that's just a a guarantee an invitation to burnout. But if we disciple the disciplers, um, that's where the quantitative magic takes place. So, John, are you, are you imagine, a, go ahead, Duncan. No, you go ahead. No, I was just going to, I can just see that. I can imagine, you know, as a, as a pastor, you just, especially, in, I mean, it's different at North Point because Andy is in a sense, the pastor of maybe 30, 40,000 people. So it's a bit harder, but in most of the churches I know in New Zealand and Australia and in Ireland and the UK, most churches are 100, 200 people, that kind of. So, so the pastor feels it's her job or his job to constantly, every time a new person comes within the purview of church, I've got to pass to them, I've got to disciple them, I've got to care for them. But how different would it be if you pick the model you talked about? And as a, as a lead pastor, you poured into, just as Jesus did, 12 people, your staff team, your key volunteers, and they pulled in, they um, poured into, just like you're doing it for them, they poured into a, yeah. a group of volunteer leaders and so that when that new person comes into the back of the church or we meet the man in the community it's not the lead pastor who's who's doing it but he's created a culture where that volunteer says i know what it's like to, to follow jesus it's showing love to these people their turf their terms i'll go ahead and do it absolutely i just saw in the chat somebody said small groups are the way exactly so so small john the ideal context in which this should happen so john talk about small groups because i know that when you first started out with Intersect, the selection of these not-for-profits long before Be Rich even began, yep. that was the catalyst. Walk us through that. Walk us through the, the program or the, the, the process that you were trying to make the connection of. Right, well, okay, so um, the vision was that uh, and you know whether we always hit this the target here or not it's another conversation we we don't but sometimes we do but the vision that that we took to this formation of intersect was small groups uh, are led by a group leader we tried to rebrand that so that the group leader self-identified as a pastor which was tremendously um daunting for many people but we tried to get away from this, the cultural, the institutional significance of the title and, and focus on the function of a pastor, which is basically to take care of the sheep, basically to disciple the sheep. So we were seeing the leader of a small group as the pastor to the group, this little, and see that's again, because the lead, the head pastor of the church, they don't have time to do this for everybody, but if they can be equipping people to lead small groups, um, helping them to understand that what they're being asked to do is to disciple the people in their small group. Then all of a sudden, like we said a, a couple of minutes ago, that quantitative magic starts to happen. You just start to influence a tremendous number of people. But the thing was, back to what we said uh, 15 or 20 minutes ago, we saw that serving out in the community in Jesus's name was an integral part of a discipleship process. Mm. And so Intersect was built to give people a way to make service um, not easy, but simple, to give them a system that they could utilize to regularly get them and their group, the people that hopefully they were discipling out in the community, serving people in Jesus' name. So John, you, were, you guys were vetting in a sense, organizations in the community, both for the work that they were doing, but also the accessibility that would be available then for a small group to participate in volunteering and serving in that place. So both the work that was being done, but also the ease of which a small group could plug in. That's what you guys yeah. were doing with Intersect. Okay. Yeah. It is a both and, you know, we wanted to serve uh, unconditionally out in the community and we wanted to develop people spiritually. And you mentioned vetting the nonprofits. It's very, very important. We invested a lot of time and energy uh, at Buckhead Church in doing that. Also, one time, uh, another person who was integral in the um, uh, starting of Intersect, her, na her name is Megan Linger. We went down to South Africa um, and spent about 10 days with a church down there in Cape Town, helping them vet uh, nonprofits who would become their Intersect partners. So you're right in emphasizing that picking the right partners in this whole thing is very, very important. 
Yeah, that's great. It doesn't, it doesn't work with everybody. Yeah. yeah. And I might, I might also add, um, not all of our partners are Christian organizations. You know, again, we get back to what we said at the top of the hour. We want people, these people have heard Jesus's name. We want them to experience Jesus's love. And yeah. so we, we unashamedly partner with some non-Christian uh, nonprofits because that gives them a chance, we hope, up close and personal to experience and see Jesus's love in action with all these people serving them in Christ's name. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let me let me um, voice something that I think, and I might be wrong, that pastors would want to voice to you, but would never voice to you, John, because it would uh, it would make them feel very vulnerable. So I'll, I'll speak on their behalf. So it doesn't matter if people think I'm being foolish and asking this question. But but um, uh, John, I understand the need to show love to people who are hurting in our community. Yep. But ultimately, don't we want people to find Jesus yep. and to start following Jesus? How do you how do you cross over from caring for them, from wrapping up their wounds, from helping them financially, from um, making their, the environment they live in better? You know, we can do all those things. And but is that enough? I mean, how do we how do we get them to church? How do we get them into a, a small group? How do we get them to find Jesus and find because that's the ultimate game? We want to grow our church. We want yeah, yeah, yeah. People absolutely, to absolutely. Closer. Well, so Duncan, let me ask you a question. Do you not think 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 of a, a homeless person who's just had a really tough life and has been on the street and finally finds their way? We'll just use Atlanta Mission. That's one of our intersect partners at Buckhead Church. Um. So all of a sudden, this group of people start showing up in his life as he's at Atlanta Mission, or maybe even back, you know, as you guys know, some homeless people spend some time in the street, then go into the mission and back on the street. Do you not think that this fictitious homeless person that represents millions of homeless people, do you not think that under the influence of the Holy Spirit, he doesn't start to ask or she what, these people, they all go to this church, and yet they're involved in my life. They care about me. I, I wonder why. Do you not think that the Holy Spirit is not going to use that in that homeless person's life to begin to uh, promote some questions like, why are they doing this? And then if he asked him, because that question comes up all the time, if you're doing it right, they'll go, why are you doing this? Why do you care about me? That gives us a chance to say, well, we care about you because God cares about you. We care about you because God cares about us. And we just, we just want to pass that love that we've received on to you. And I think, you know, um, that's all to say that it, the Holy Spirit is interwoven into all of this. And you know this, you guys, the Holy Spirit is the one who saves us. And time and time and time and time again, I've seen the Holy Spirit use self, selfless acts of service to provoke in the recipient of that service questions about maybe this God that I've written off is real after all. Maybe this God who I thought hated me because of my lifestyle, maybe this God loves me. So I would want to, you know, we've been talking about both and as a kind of a theme of our conversation this morning. I would want to say that, especially in a culture that is saturated with hearing the name of Jesus, the very best way to evangelize people in that is to help them experience the love of Jesus. And we've seen that time and again, not, o not only uh, in the, uh, the people that receive the care, but sometimes even um, uh, amongst the staff of the nonprofits. Yeah. So it's a powerful way uh, to tell people about Jesus and his love. I would argue maybe in a, in a postmodern culture such as ours, Maybe it's the most powerful, not the only way, but maybe one of the most powerful ways to tell people about Jesus. That's great. I mean, I, I, do you not, I could just imagine some people in church thinking I could spend all day um, sitting with a homeless person, helping them find a home, helping them find a job, helping giving them some clothes, bathing their feet. I could spend all day cooking soup so it's available in the soup kitchen. I could spend all day caring for somebody. But if that person then turns around to me and says, how do I become a Christian? I want what you've got. I don't know where to begin with that. And and so one of the things in the chat that Rob's put in, he says, oh, there's certain, you know, because you, you said, you know, you said the best 
the best part of training and discipleship is just get people out there in the job aren't there some roles that, that require training do we not have to train our people who are going out into the community that, that when someone says how do i become a christian that we don't get tongue-tied but we know how to explain the love of god in us Absolutely. That's essential. But that gets us back to the what we would say is essential to this process is the pre-existent relationship where the we'll use the small group uh, paradigm where the, the small group leader, the pastor of that group <clears throat> is been discipling these people all along. And that includes in part, what do you say when people ask you about Jesus? So if the relationship is in existence prior to the access service, that's where the training occurs. But it's got to Again, it's it's got to be it's well, <clears throat> in it, its most potent form is when these relationships are up and running well before the acts of service occur. I would say that's crucial to this actually being a an expression of discipleship. I would say that's crucial to this actually being an act of evangelism. Yeah, but so, I, I want I want to say this too. Um, you know, we're supposed to love people unconditionally. And we need to make sure that the, we were, we're just using this fictitious homeless person as an example. We need to make sure that in our eagerness to see that person be saved by Jesus, that he doesn't start to feel like some sort of target, that he doesn't feel like some sort of, you know, well, you just want to feel good about yourself by getting me to pray some prayer. You know, people, people are smart. If, if they start to feel like a means to an end, they pick up on that and they start to back out. Say, this person just wants another notch on his spiritual pistol. So I'm out of here. So we need to do a gut check. The love needs to be unconditional. It doesn't need to have, well, we'll love you as long as you accept Jesus. You know, people get sniff that out and they're gone. And Christians are guilty of that. So we need to make our love for homeless people as unconditional as God's love is for us. That's it. Anything else starts to distort the process, which I think I think we're getting to, guys. I think we're getting to this idea of what's the win, because if if we start with the win being, I want to grow my church, or I've even got to convert and convince people of something that they have to change or transform then I think we may get ourselves into this mode of people becoming projects instead of people. And if the real aim is just to love them, period, and allow the Holy Spirit to do the work of transformation in their life the way he can only do it, then maybe we, we measure whether we're endearing ourselves to the community, not so much by how many people converted <clears throat> from the not-for-profit we're serving into the pew on a Sunday, maybe the measurement looks different to how well we're doing with this endearing, John. I, and I don't have an answer to that. It's a question, what, how do we measure then if it's not about getting people from the community into our building? What does it look like to measure the success of this, I, this endearing? Well, that's, that's, you know, this new department that we have at Buckhead Church, of which I'm a part, this, you know, for Atlanta department of which uh, community relationships and community engagement is a significant part. We're, we're wrestling with that right now. What, you know, what sort of metrics are applicable to this kind of a thing? And we're still, we're still trying to sort that out. We don't know. Um, so if you two or any of your listeners get any ideas about what metrics we can use, um, let me know. We're we're on a, we're in search mode on that right now. Well, you've got this, John. You do have this great kind of tag statement or question, I guess, that I really love under this idea of endearing yourself to the community. It's we want to be known in the community. We want people to know that the church exists. We want them to be glad that it exists, and we want them to be better off for it. So, I guess in some ways, you have defined what that means then to endear yourself to the community. Are yes. people becoming more aware of you? <clears throat> are they more glad that you're there? And are they better off that you're there? How yeah, to and, measure that's tricky. Yeah, that's exactly. So uh, at a conceptual level, you just nailed it, Jason. The tricky part is how do you actually measure, how do you gather and measure that data in some sort of an accurate way? Yeah, yeah. Um, that, and you know, that doesn't distort the data, you know, um, so... 
but we're working on it and we'll um we'll keep you posted and um, we're we were hoping to figure some of that stuff out i love it